An early ask for funding from the Detroit Institute of Arts. Museum director Salvador Seller Pons is here to explain why. We'll break down a new report card for our region. And the real Jimmy Hoffa story that's wilder than any movie. Today is Sunday, December 8, 2019, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Good to have you with us. We've got a really full morning coming up. We're going to take stock of the region as we come to the end of 2019. The new findings were released this week by the Detroit Regional Chamber. On the whole, we find a lot of things growing and improving in Michigan, but not as quickly as we might like, and not as quickly as the states with whom we compete. And the trade war continues to be a challenge as well in a state so reliant on exports. While as a nation, we saw an uptick of nearly 8% in exports, Michigan saw a 3% drop. We're gonna talk about that coming up this morning. Also, there has been a ton of talk about the Scorsese, De Niro, Pacino, Pesci film, The Irishman, a three and a half hour opus on Jimmy Hoffa. Maybe it's missing the point to call out the movie's inaccuracies, but the truth is better than just about any fiction when it comes to Jimmy Hoffa. And our Steve Garagiola is going to be here to talk about his terrific new podcast a little bit later on. But we're going to start this morning with the DIA. We learned this week their millage request will be on the ballot this spring. Not everyone is happy about that. The director of the DIA, Salvador Seller Pons, is here to make his case. He's up first today on Flashpoint. This past week, the final hurdles were cleared to get the DIA millage renewal on the March 10th ballot. This millage request comes two years early, and that has rankled many. In fact, the Detroit News editorial called it a slap in the face, especially when paired with the timing of the election going on the Democratic primary ballot rather than the general that would be in November. Let's talk about it with the head of the Detroit Institute of Arts, Salvador Seller Pons. Always good to have you on Flashpoint. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, let, let's start with that criticism about the timing of this mm -hmm. election, that it's kind of cynical to just uh, cherry pick your voters and say we're going to do this in March when it's mostly going to be Democrats come, uh, turning out to vote rather than in, in November where you would have a much more general cross-section of voters. Voters. We're just trying to plan ahead and uh, follow the example of the Detroit Zoo that went two years in advance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we run the, the museum like a business. We want to make sure we have the resources to plan our programs for the future. So uh, asking the voters early on if we can continue providing the service, it's uh, responsible. But it doesn't hurt to know that there are voters who might be more likely to go along with a millage increase, or, or not an extension, I shouldn't say an increase. It's an extension, it's a renewal of the work that we've been doing. I think we want to put out there uh, the work that we've done in the last eight years and have uh, the residents of Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County decide whether uh, they want to continue with this uh, extraordinary agreement. It's been a win-win situation for the residents and for the DIA. The, the other thing, though, that seemed to be uh, in 2012 a, a promise that you wouldn't be coming back and asking for money early. Why are we all of a sudden needing money after um, a sense that uh, we were taking care of the DIA for a long time and, and now we find ourselves two years short. Look, uh, the leaders of the museum, when they asked the residents of Oakland, Wayne, and Malcolm County in 2012 to support this millage, didn't know two things that uh, are very important. First of all, that the city of Detroit was going to go through bankruptcy and that the DI was going to raise $100 million to support the pensioners of the city. Yep. Uh, they didn't know that the uh, museum uh, would own the collection, the building, and the grounds, and that is connected to the story of the bankruptcy. And the second thing was that this millage and the service agreement that goes with it was going to transform the organization. Today, we are a place completely different than we won in 2012. The culture of the DI has changed. In the past, generally speaking, we were an organization that was looking inwards. Today, we are looking outwards. We are serving the community. We have become a tool for the community. We are changing people's lives. I, I think that's hard to argue against that. I, I, it does feel like the DIA is much more outward looking now and very engaged in the community around it. But the fact remains, um, in 2012, the operating budget for the DIA was about $25 million. For fiscal year 2020, it's going to be $38 million. Mm. So uh, there's two ways to look at this. Yes, I suppose on one way you could say this is a revenue issue, that I need more money. But other people would say, no, you've got a spending problem. <laughs> 
Well, uh, look, it is true that in 2012, the uh, operating budget of the DIA was $25 million. But in 2011, it was $33 million. So at the time, we dramatically reduced our operating budget to being able to keep the doors open of the museum. And that's why we went to the counties to ask for the support. So today is 38, so it's just a $5 million increase. And at the same time, we have provided this amazing service to the community. It provides free general admission, unlimited, to the Tri-County residents. We bring to the DI over 62,000 students from the Tri-County every year. We pay for the buses and provide uh, curriculum-based programs. We bring a number of seniors to the museum when we pay for the buses as, as well. And then we have yeah. extraordinary uh, uh, community partnership that is uh, taking the museum out into the, into the counties. It's become a very activated space uh, in, in a lot of different people. You always, I think, envisioned it as being a, a gathering place. We, I think that's more true than ever. And as I've told you before, I think the story of the Grand Bargain is that Detroit is a city that was saved by its art. But you can also, I suppose, still uh, be accused of going to the well too often and maybe taking that support for granted. Uh, are, are you, what, what happens if this doesn't pass? Well, uh, we will have to plan differently with, if it doesn't happen. We want to continue being a leader in education. And uh, the residents of Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County have made the DIA a leader in education. The Tri County residents have made the DIA a place that is a part of the comeback of South uh, East Michigan. The Tri County residents have made the DIA a place that provides experiences that people don't find in books, in TV, or the internet. Yeah. We have a great array of programs. We have diversified our exhibitions. And for example, now we do shows like the one that is coming up next summer on car design. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we do exhibitions about Van Gogh. And those two exhibitions will be on view at the DI in okay. the summer of 2020. I think you've always sort of bristled at the idea of being a dusty old place of just the old <laughs> masters. You've done everything from the art of baseball and yeah. baseball cards uh, to the art of hip hop. Yeah. Uh, to talk a little bit about what that kind of exploration of extending art beyond its usual boundaries, what that's meant for you. You know, we are focusing on creativity and creativity can be translated in many different things. It can be baseball cards, it can be hip hop, it can be a Star Wars of the power of Right, yes. But it also can be Van Gogh, it can be Monet. So it is a way of saying, you know, creativity is the central part of the many things that we do in the museum. And our visitors can connect with that creativity in different art forms. Uh, I mentioned the editorial in the Detroit News. It was one of several that we saw that were very critical of what you're trying to do. I'm curious as to what you're hearing mostly uh, from the people who have always been there to support you before. Because I know that as you've been trying to raise this endowment uh, to $400 million or so, which would kind of make you much more fully independent, um, some of those folks who were asked to really pony up back during the, uh, the grand bargain are the ones that now are saying, look, I've given all I can. So where do you feel like the level of, of support is now from the people you've relied on for so long? So, you know, we have a lot of support out there in the community, and this is because of the work that we have done beyond the walls of the museum. The Arts Authority, the Borough Commissioners of the Tri-County are there supporting us. You know, uh, when we raised so much money during the grand bargain, those hundred million dollars went to the city of Detroit. We didn't keep that, those funds. So we just need to continue serving the community and raising the funds to make our endowment as strong as possible, but at the same time, guarantee that we can provide these amazing services to the community. We are a museum that is a role model for museums all over the country. We have professionals from museums around the United States come to the DI to see how we do this work. Do you feel comfortable in saying, look, this is the last time we're going to have to ask you for this because you, you, you believe that you'll, in, you'll have the endowment by the time it rolls around again? Or is it foolish to make such promises? Look, I don't have the crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen in 10 years or 12 years. Let the people leading the museum at that time and the residents of Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County decide for that. They will be deciding that March 10th, at least on this newest request. <laughs> Salvador, thanks very much for being Thank here this so morning. Much. I appreciate it. We come back, we'll talk about the state of the region. Sandy Baru is here with a new report card out. This is Flashpoint on Local 4.
Is your house cold and drafty? Are your energy bills through the roof? With Michigan's winter being so unpredictable, you cannot afford not to insulate your home another winter. Stop bleeding money. Insulate your walls and attic. Cut your energy bill up to 50% with Ace and Sons. For 90 years, inspired by St. Francis of Assisi, the Capuchin Soup Kitchen has been privileged to serve people facing difficult circumstances. Today we have evolved to include programs like On the Rise Bakery that help support people's long-term goals in life and address root causes of suffering. We rely 100% on donors and volunteers to fulfill our mission. We can't do this work without your help. Thank you for being a friend to the Capuchin Soup Kitchen. If happiness is a great night's sleep, you'll be thrilled when you shop Gardner White now. For one final weekend, you get never before Black Friday steals on iComfort and Temper Peating, like this iComfort Queen with a free power base. You get it all only $12 a month. Or a Temper Peating set with a free 4K TV, now just $25 a month. Plus, take advantage of 72 months interest free. And only Gardner White has free same day delivery. If you buy your mattress anywhere else, you'll pay too much. Don't overpay, save. Sunday and Monday, only at Gardner White. Right now, buy a high-efficiency furnace and get AC free. Install with payments as low as $52 a month. Call today. Go with the name you know. Fantasma, Fantasma. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. Over the fields we go, laughing all the way. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Yeah. Welcome back. The new year will bring quite a few state of addresses and calculations, state of the union, state of the state, so on and so on. Uh, it's the end of the year, though, that brings us the annual state of the region report from the Detroit Regional Chamber. The findings, a lot of things are moving in the right direction but not fast enough for our own good, nor to keep up with our competitors in other states. Let's take stock of it all with the head of the Detroit Regional Chamber, Sandy Barua, who unveiled this report this past week. Sandy, good to have you back. Thanks for having and me. And let me quickly point out the best excuse I've ever heard for having to cancel an appearance on Flashpoint was when you called me this past summer and said, I'm sorry, but I'm getting a new kidney. Yeah, I, I, you know, and I figured I'm making great progress by actually showing up this time. So <laughs> this thanks, is, thanks for trusting me. Well, this is your me. first visit since then, and it it's is. great to know things are going so well great. for you. And really. thanks for let me call you at oh dark 30 in the morning. It was, no, it was, it was a great call. It was really something. Um, on to, on to uh, these other matters. Yes. I, I said off the top of the program, the, the, the one that jumped out at me was what was going on with exports. Uh, the rest of the country sees this nice, healthy burst of exports, even in a, even in a troubled trade year. We lost uh, over 3% in, in exports. How much of the trouble can we attribute to the trade war? Oh, I think all of it. I mean, when you look at what the national public policy is regarding trade and tariffs, it is having a disproportionate impact on Michigan. Because when you look at the nation, and the nation is up 7.7% .7 in exporting, Michigan is down over 3%. We're the 10th largest exporting state in the nation, and we are the 6th largest exporting region here, right here in Detroit. So when you see that kind of dichotomy, that means that national policy is having a disproportionate impact on us. And you see it as all, the other uh, metric here that you really see that showing up in is not just in exports, but in the amount of foreign investment, that yep. we're direct foreign investment that we see in Michigan. Exactly. So we went from $2.5 billion in direct foreign investment in the year prior. In the most recent year where we have data available, it went down to $1 billion. That's a $1.5 billion delta. And that means foreign companies are keeping their powder dry. They're not investing in infrastructure. And that's not any different than what you're seeing in domestic companies. You know, and that's why, one of the reasons why you see the stock market going up so, so much, because there's a lot of cash out there, both in private hands and in corporate hands. And you know, they got to put it somewhere, and they're putting it in the stock yeah. market. You look at the overall growth of GDP among states that we compete with, and in this case, I guess it's all of them, really, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Michigan, right around the national average, our growth uh, in GDP, which a little less than the national average, yeah. about 9%. But the states that are really killing it right now, Washington State 
19% growth. What are they getting right that we're not? Well, one, it's the availability of talent. When you look at the areas, now I'm talking about kind of the Seattle to Tacoma area, mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, uh, northwest corner of the northwest corner, you know, is just a talent magnet. And when you Amazon, think Microsoft, Amazon, Microsoft, yeah. everyone, uh, you know, everyone is there, right? I mean, Amazon, I think, has 17 campuses in the city of Seattle. Yeah. So uh, that's what's driving it. But you also, when you look at, like, say, Eastern Washington, you know, they have huge agriculture. Their wine industry is going gangbusters. Their agriculture industry is probably impacted by the tariffs. Uh, so I don't know how they're doing. They're, but, yes, they're being, yeah. th that, that's, a, that's a depressed number then probably that probably, I just gave Probably, but you. I tell you, the, the, the talent that's being attracted to the West Coast is something that we have to battle with every day. And I know it because I grew up there. Yeah, and, and I don't think you've stopped talking about the talent drain and problem that we have in Michigan really since <laughs> when you look governor, at it was Governor Snyder's uh, every speech yeah and but and and I think it's gonna be Governor Whitmer's every speech as well too when you look at the big flashing red light that our region and frankly our state has is that we are below the national average in educational attainment you know and we are at the bottom of our peer group that we compete against uh, in educational attainment and think of it this way if we had best-in-class educational attainment, if we were like at Boston or Washington DC levels, we would add about $50 billion a year to our economy. And our economy, put that in perspective, is about a $250 billion a year economy. And for every percentage point gain we have with uh, another percentage point in educational attainment, someone with a BS or an associate's degree, that's almost $1,300 a year per person in per capita These income. Quantum huge, huge impact. And in fact, this year, um, almost uh, side by side, you did a state of, of education in the state. Um, I don't think anybody needs to hear another, look, we're really lagging. Where do you find the hope right now in trying to fix this problem that all of a sudden Michigan's no longer a leader in education as yeah. we were not that long ago? No, so I, there's two reasons for hope. One, uh, you know, let's credit uh, Nikolai Vitti. I mean, he's doing all the right things. He's making real progress. We didn't get in this mess in the city of Detroit overnight. We're not gonna get out of it overnight, but it's people like Nikolai Vitti who's gonna make it happen in Detroit. It's just gonna take a while. The second thing I find hope in, uh, I have the privilege of serving on the steering committee for Launch Michigan, which is that statewide, it is a business, labor, education, civic leadership uh, group that's been now together over a year, just focusing on what do we need to do policy-wise, K through 12 in the state of Michigan. It is a hard slog. I really credit our, our leaders for that, but we need to get this done. Well, last thing I wanted to get to, the other, we, you talked a lot about where we are in population, losing uh, a, a sl slight gains in population, which is better than cities right. like Cleveland, Let's celebrate Chicago. a win when we can. Yeah, exactly. But real growth in Detroit with millennials. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. We are the fastest growing. In, uh, we beat the national average. We beat our peer group, except for one, uh, in terms of the growth in millennials. And that's basically, right. you know, if you consider that group kind of, you know, early 20s to early 30s, college educated of all races. Yeah. And they are flooding into the region, particularly the city. Yeah, that was a fascinating takeaway, along with many others. Uh, we'll, in fact, we'll put links to the uh, to the reports on uh, clickondetroit.com. Sandy, it's always good to have you here. Thanks and for being here. Really great to see you. Been... Looking so hale and hearty. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. We come back, we'll talk with Steve Garagiola, the Jimmy Hoffa story. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. For guiding harvest is a lifesaver for a mother like myself with children and having so many snacks and lunches to make. The food from Forgotten Harvest make me feel better in school. Because these children around this community really look for Forgotten Harvest. And I thank Forgotten Harvest for helping me and my family out. Forgotten Harvest needs your support to help families in need. We need your help today. Are you ready for this? For one final weekend, Black Friday price cuts remain in effect at Gardner White. Start with 65% off. Plus, take an extra $100 off for every $500 you spend, all with no tax. That's an instant $100 rebate off the sale prices that were already the lowest. Tax-free. Your net price is close to cost. Get 60 months interest-free, same-day delivery, no tax, and free TVs. We want your business. Don't overpay. Black Friday's back, and you save. Sunday and Monday, only at Gardner White. All of the excitement around the holidays can be overwhelming, especially for someone struggling with depression, suicidal thoughts, or other mental health or disability related issues. Many of us have seasonal affective disorder, 
or could show signs of something more serious. If you or someone you love is suffering, you don't have to face it alone. Call the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network. Here to talk, here to help 24-7-800-241-4949. Monday at 5, imagine knowing you're sick, but nobody would believe you. We're all, you know, thought to be kind of crazy. Everything's in your head because your labs are all negative. Now, these local women and a former Local 4 reporter are finally being heard. I couldn't get out of bed. The depression's gone. I had suicidal depression so bad. That is all gone. Their cure? Getting their breast implants removed. See why their long fight is finally starting to show progress with doctors and the FDA. Monday on Local 4 News at 5. You know, our fascination around here with the story of Jimmy Hoffa never really goes out of style, it seems. With the new film, The Irishman, the story is front and center nationally again. I hope you got a chance to see Steve Garagiola's documentary on Local 4 last week. If you didn't, head to clickondetroit.com to give it a look. And just as recommended, the podcast Steve has put together, and Steve Garagiola is here to talk about all things Hoffa. Steve, this has been fascinating because I'm going to assume that, like me, we've been around here a long time, you thought you knew the Jimmy Hoffa story. <laughs> well, you know, for me, quite the contrary. I knew about Hoffa what I think most people know. I thought, well, all right, I've been here a while. We've done all these FBI digs. So I know he was a labor leader. I know he had some kind of mob connections. Right. I know he made enemies with some bad people <laughs> because they made him go away. Right. And uh, I guess that's all I need to know. And then we started looking. And you know, I keep describing it as this rabbit hole. Yes. You go down the hole and all these tunnels go to New York, to Johnny Dio, to New Orleans, to Santo Traficante and Carlos Marcella, to the Kennedy assassination, to Nixon. It runs all over the place. He had his hand in so many things that I had no idea. So it's been such an education and so much fun, so interesting. It, absolutely. And the other thing that really, see, this is why I said earlier, but it's really hard to make fiction this good. As, oh, absolutely. As, as what's real. Because the characters he was surrounded by, these are all right out of Elmore Leonard. We got guys named Three Fingers and the Weasel. And Frankie Honor. Three Fingers Coppola, <laughs> Marvin the Weasel Elkin, who was his driver. And, we, you know, we just stumbled upon these people as we went along. We were about three months into the project when came across Marvin Elkin. He said, all right, anybody named Marvin the Weasel, <laughs> we got to find out more about this guy. And we found him up in Toronto, and it turns out he was Hoffa's driver for five years. And the stories he shared about the guys who were in the back seat yeah. every day with Hoffa and how he wished every day there was a glass partition there <laughs> so he, could, he couldn't hear know. what he was yes. hearing. <laughs> Just amazing stories. And you and I were also, it's hard to imagine how you complimentarily get the nickname The Weasel. The Weasel. There must be something more charitable there than we can figure out. Um, the, Ken the Kennedy portion of this is a part that I absolutely had no clue, the, the rancor that existed between both Bobby and John Kennedy and Jimmy Hoffa. Well, yeah, I had no idea at all. You know, Pierre Salinger, who was an aide to John Kennedy as president, he's the one who coined the phrase uh, blood feud, yeah. that the Kennedys and more Bobby Kennedy, but the Kennedys and Hoffa hated each other. This was not political. This was actual visceral personal hatred for each other. On his part, on Hoffa's part, it was because they came so hard at him. Bobby Kennedy, and he, he explained it as such, made a life mission of putting Jimmy Hoffa in prison. The Get Hoffa squad that he set up as attorney general yeah. was to put Jimmy Hoffa in prison. Hoffa, allegedly, never proven, but allegedly contacted a guy named Ed Parton down in New Orleans to blow up Bobby Kennedy's home with his family in it. And Ed Parton Holy said smokes. he wouldn't do it. Yeah. So, yeah, it was more than rancor. Yeah. It was visceral hatred between these two. The, the bordered almost on homicide, as we see there. Well, and yeah. it may have, because... Well, though that, yes. Because ultimately, Hoffa's alleged fingerprints are on the Kennedy assassination. Once it was concluded in 1979 that it was indeed a conspiracy, a conspiracy, then, subsequent to that, evidence starts to point at Carlos Marcello and Santo Traficante, and a mob hit. No great conspiracy involving the CIA and, and Castro and Cubans. Cuba, right. A mob hit that Jimmy Hoffa may have had a hand in. And 
all of these things you find as you start digging around a little bit. So it, it, here we here we go down here the we go hole. down the rabbit hole again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's so much attention about the movie right now and uh, the, the Irishman. There's 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 a number of things there that I, I are, are inaccurate. In fact, one of the people you talked to kind of got in Robert De Niro's face about how wrong the movie was. Well, Dan Maldea is the guy you're referring to. Dan wrote a book called uh, Hoffa Wars. He is really considered the godfather of the Hoffa investigations. He was there from day one. One. Using and the term Godfather advisedly. Yeah, here. well, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but he is just one of the investigators we talked to that said that the whole premise of the movie, this Frank Sheeran, is baloney. Yeah. It's just nonsense. Number one, La Cosa Nostra, the mob, would not have invited this outsider into a, a, a plot, into a plot like this, because it's a very closed culture, La Cosa Nostra, whether it's Detroit, Chicago, or New York. Number two, Frank Sheeran, if you know about how it got to where, where it was with his story, he wrote a book. The shorthand version is he wrote a book about life in the mob. Nobody was interested. Yeah, he wrote a couple other revisions of this book, and it suddenly dawned on him, oh, now I remember. I killed Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> so that was in his third edition of the book. And then, bam, New York Times bestseller, yeah. a movie. So, Nobody who's a credible investigator believes, believes Frank Sheeran part of the, did this. Story. But okay, it's it's well the, in the minute it's we, good cinema. In the minute we have left, as you know, the eye, our eyes roll in the newsroom because every uh, six weeks somebody says, "Oh, they've got a new tip on what happened to Jimmy Hoffa and where he is." Were you able to arrive at a conclusion that you feel like you can live with? <laughs> no. We didn't, we didn't find Jimmy Hoffa, I can tell you that much. Uh, he, he could have been his body incinerated. He could be under the Pulaski Skyway in New Jersey. He could be under the Renaissance Center or in Milford or in Oakland Township or any number of other places we know. Probably not the corner of the end zone at Giant Stadium. Which we was, know he's we, not we there. We know he's not there. But that's the uh, only one we know. I highly recommend uh, Steve's podcast. It's going to be about six parts or yes. so. Uh, it's uh, part of uh, we, uh, the fourth season of what we call the Shattered Podcast uh, uh, here at Local 4. Uh, you can find it uh, available at all of the places where you find your own podcast. Just search Hoffa. Uh, the fi terrific work from Steve Garagiola. Congratulations on all this. I know you've really enjoyed doing it. I have loved it. Thanks so much for being here, Steve. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, meet the Press coming up next right after Mitch Albums, Heart of Detroit. Have a great week. We'll see you next time right here at Flashpoint.